Hello and welcome to another episode of Second Hand Stories. This is a place where I tell you stories. What kind? Well, histories, mysteries and unbelievable stories. And here is this week's story. In May of 2021, the Indian Met Department is looking at something very alarming. What they're looking at is the start of a cyclone. The images show them a cyclone that is perhaps the biggest cyclone to ever hit India's western coast. This cyclone, they call it Cyclone Tokte. And it's moving northward. It's going to pass over Mumbai and then head toward Gujarat. But it's passing 70 kilometers off the coast of Mumbai. And it's passing right over some very precious oil fields. These oil fields had been discovered in the 1960s and they were extremely rich in oil. In fact, they were so rich that they supplied two thirds of India's domestic oil production. These oil fields were operated by the Oil and Natural Gas Commission or ONGC. And when Cyclone Tokte was about to pass over these oil fields, several warnings had been issued to get people out to safety away from these oil fields. However, for one reason or another, mostly man-made, mostly preventable, a lot of people who were working at one particular oil field, the Hira oil field, they remained oblivious to the threat. Now, the people were housed in these structures called barges. Barges were essentially large floating hotels. These were accommodations provided for the people who worked on the oil rig. These were floating hotels that didn't have propellers and could not move. And they were attached to the oil rig with anchors. On May 16th, 2021, there were 261 men still on a barge that was connected to the Hira oil field just as Cyclone Tokte hit. And when it hit, it snapped the anchors and the barge crashed into the oil rig and began sinking. The men on the barge, they radio for help, desperately begging for help and then when the barge begins sinking further and further they put on their orange life vests and jump into the cold sea now as these radio pleas for help come in it reaches the navy and the navy dispatches a destroyer a destroyer called INS Kochi out to the Hira oil field now, INS Kochi makes its way to the oil field. It sees that there are a lot of people who need rescuing and they immediately begin their job, they begin their duty. And they work tirelessly through the 17th of May. Now, as day turns to night, there are still so many men in the water that INS Kochi realizes that they need more help. They need as much help as they can get, including air support and that is when communication goes out to INS Shikra. This is a naval air station in Kolaba, Mumbai and that's when Commander Bipin Panikar hears about his mission. He has to set out at first light out to Hira oil field and see how many men he can save. The next morning when first light approaches the whole air station starts readying itself for this flight that's going to take off. This first pilot flight that's going to take off is going to be a flight that's going to chart this territory, chart the route and then relay back the information. It's extremely critical that this flight goes well. Now things begin ominously. As the morning of 18th approaches, the cyclone has still not abated. It's so windy that the roof of the hangar has been ripped off. 
the blades of the seeking helicopters they are shaking and banging against each other it's almost impossible for them to take off in these conditions but take off they absolutely must the lives of people depend on them so here's what they do with great difficulty they drag the seeking helicopter from where it's at and they bring it to stand in between two sheds between two hangars and this is done to basically cut the wind effect now as the helicopter is standing in between these two hangars they try to get it moving and commander bipin panikar boards this helicopter along with three other people he has a co-pilot he has a navigator and he has a master chief flight diver called pralad now the four men get into this helicopter and they are trying to take off to give you an idea about how difficult the conditions were and how unprecedented they were let me tell you this when they were trying to take off the entire base all the men at the base had gathered at this spot and they were willing and hoping and encouraging and shouting and just absolutely doing whatever they could to support the take off of this particular helicopter now what was supposed to be just a regular routine take off has suddenly turned into an hour long ordeal but finally the helicopter lifts off the ground and as it heads out into the sea commander bipin panikar gets a very very ominous feeling because straight ahead of him he can see two things one the sea is extremely rough the waves are crashing the whole sea seems extremely angry the second thing he can see is the clouds and if it was even possible they seemed to get darker and darker the further out they went in all his training he had been taught that if there was inclement weather then pilots were supposed to steer clear of it but in this particular instance circumstances dictated that he flew straight into these ever darkening clouds and so the helicopter starts heading out now the wind was so tremendous that the stick in the helicopter had begun shaking by itself and commander bipin panikar had to keep adjusting it to make compensations for the wind it was extremely tremendous and they were being jostled around now they make their way into this cloudy dense darkness and they eventually fly up and they reach to about a thousand feet now at a thousand feet they're clear of the clouds and things become much lighter they're covering a lot of ground it's about 90 to 100 nautical miles to the destination they make up a lot of ground and eventually they start descending they descend from a thousand feet to about 500 feet now they are below the clouds again and as they get below the clouds suddenly everything goes dark and it goes dark because that's how thick the cloud cover is there is no light suddenly it feels to them as if they are flying in the night and to make things even more terrifying there are flashes of lightning happening all around them the cockpit is getting illuminated with this bright flash of light and then suddenly it goes back to darkness they switch on the light in the cockpit and they fly further and further out they make a zigzag pattern to try to avoid the worst of the weather and eventually they get closer to where they have to be as they're getting closer things start to get worse here's what happens the instruments in the helicopter which were reliant on pressure suddenly they start going wonky they don't know their air speed because the device to measure air speed and their altitude has been compromised the one thing that does work is the radio altimeter the radio altimeter works because it's sending radio signals down to the surface and the radio waves bounce back up and it gives them an estimate of how high up they are from the water thankfully that's one of the few things that is working they get to the coordinates that they have been sent 
and as they get to these coordinates they lower the helicopter further but suddenly they can't see a thing there are no ships in the water there are no people in the water there's nothing the visibility is poor no doubt but yet they should have seen something they hover around and they circle the spot they check the coordinates again but they are at the right spot they don't know what is happening now it's at this moment that the navigator suddenly catches something on the radar what he catches is about 30 nautical miles out he tells commander bipin panikar that they have to go 30 nautical miles further commander bipin panikar hopes that his navigator is right he hopes that they haven't gotten the wrong target on the radar because 30 nautical miles meant 15 minutes of flight time 15 minutes of fuel that was going to be burnt and if they didn't find the survivors then they might have to turn back because fuel was limited and if they got caught in this kind of weather things could go badly very fast they fly 30 nautical miles further and when they break cloud cover suddenly they can see this whole horrible scene below them they can see ins kochi the destroyer sent by the navy trying its best to help survivors out the sea seems to be filled with these bright orange life vests that are bobbing and getting thrown around by this extremely angry sea there are other ships in the area also trying to help out now the scene seems to be made even more horrifying as they look closer because as they look closer into the water they see that though men are being tossed about they do not have signs of life a lot of the men are gone but they don't have time to process this tragedy at this point in time they have to save as many men as they can as many men that have survived now here's what they decide to do they decide to help the people who have strayed away from the bigger group of people and the reason for that was this those who were still near other people they at least had the support of others at least mentally they could help each other out although physically they were completely drained with their time in the water the ones who had drifted apart the ones who had been separated their psychological condition would have been very very bleak they wouldn't have been able to survive for a very long time all alone in the water so they decide to go for those people first now as they're scanning the water suddenly the co-pilot spots a man who's desperately trying to hold his chin above the water he guides them to the man and now here's where it gets extremely challenging now usually they would have left the helicopter on automatic hover and it would be stationary at the same spot and they would be able to carry out the mission seamlessly this would work very well if the sea was calm and the surface wasn't as unsteady here the waves were jostling the whole place about the waves were high it was extremely difficult and the system wouldn't work so they had to manually hover the helicopter now they're manually holding it in place and it's still extremely difficult the reason being that as they would maneuver the helicopter above this survivor suddenly the malicious sea would drag this person 15 to 20 feet away and they would have to reposition the helicopter it was getting extremely difficult there was no way for them to get this person steady under the helicopter and so commander bipin panikar turns to master chief flight diver pralad and tells him pralad you'll have to get into the water pralad immediately gets ready he is ready to go but right before he leaps out of the helicopter commander bipin panikar stops him and he warns him he says pralad under no circumstances must you ever take off your harness because in commander bipin panikar's mind there is a small doubt although master chief flight diver pralad is experienced is a good swimmer he can't trust the sea if 
Pralad loses the harness, there might be a situation where they might lose not only the survivor, but also the flight diver. So Pralad agrees and he jumps into the water. He would later describe how he saves people and this is how he does it. He dives into the water. The sea is extremely rough. It's very, very difficult conditions. He can barely see anything. The wind is still whipping past him. The sea is throwing everything into confusion. He spots the survivor and he starts making his way to the survivor and he makes his way from the front where the survivor can see him. And doing this basically assures the survivor that help is on the way. As Prahlad gets close to the survivor, he suddenly dives under the water and he emerges again behind the survivor. Now behind the survivor, he tips the survivor back and holds his chin above the water. Now the reason they do this is extremely telling and it's extremely important. The reason they do this is because the person who has been in the water for this long, who has been waiting for help, who is drained of energy, when they see help coming, they get so desperate that they immediately grab onto the diver and compromising both people. So for this reason, the diver goes behind the person and then holds the person up. After doing this, they are able to winch the person into the helicopter. Now this takes 20 long minutes, 20 minutes of fighting an extremely violent sea. 20 minutes later, they have got this person into the helicopter and Pralla dives back into the water a second time. They save a second person. Now, it's taken so long. They've been battling the sea for this long. And now, fuel is running low. They have to turn back. They've also got two people in the helicopter. Both of them need immediate medical attention. They need to get out immediately. So they begin turning the helicopter around and they're about to make their way back to the naval air station. And just then, Commander Bipin Panikar scans the water and he sees a man who is looking up at the helicopter, screaming and begging for help with his hands folded. It is such a heartbreaking sight. And in that moment, Commander Pipin Panikar can put himself in the position of this particular person. You can imagine what it must be like to be this person, to be out in the water, in this cold, frigid water for so many hours, wearing that bright orange life vest, hanging on to it for dear life. The waves are throwing you about. You're constantly spitting out seawater. You have survived a long and lonely night in this absolutely brutal, choppy, squally sea. And somehow you have clung on to life and consciousness and you have seen a helicopter arrive. You are so close to being saved. And then you see this helicopter turn around about to leave you. You can imagine how your hope might just snap altogether. Commander Bipin Panikar knows that he must now save this person. So they stop the helicopter above this particular survivor and Master Chief Flight Diver Pralad again leaves the helicopter and jumps into the water. Now this man who was in the water was so exhausted he was so spent, he had such little energy that he could not help Pralad to get him back to safety. He was of no help. And so it was so difficult to get this man into the helicopter that Master Chief Flight Diver Pralad had no option but to take his harness off. Now in this moment, anything could have happened. The sea could have pulled him away this whole thing could have ended in a bigger disaster, but it didn't. He was able to get this man winched up to the helicopter and risen up to safety. Now with three people in this helicopter and with fuel and time running out, Commander Bipin Panikar races back to INS Shikra. 
Now, as he's gunning this helicopter back to base, he hopes and prays that the three people who they have managed to dredge out of the water, he hopes and prays that they survive the flight, that they get to help, that they get medical attention. And somehow they get back to the base. And when they land, thankfully, the three men are still with them. But when they land, they also realize that they were dangerously close to losing fuel completely. Fuel levels were very, very, very low. But they have no time to think about their good fortune. Commander Bipin Panikar gets out of the helicopter, immediately rounds up his men and debriefs them about what they've been through. He tells them the best route to get to the survivors. He tells them about the conditions. And then the men immediately start running more missions. More helicopters fly out and the missions would continue non-stop almost for about two days. 261 men were left stranded in some of the worst conditions that the shores of Mumbai have seen. Stuck in a cyclone, stuck in waters that are doing their best to take your life from you. Out of the 261 men who had entered the water, the Navy through the destroyer INS Kochi and the other ships, along with the seeking helicopters and the air support. Between all of them, they were able to save the lives of 186 men. 75 men still lost their lives. It was the fourth biggest disaster of this nature in the world. And this was a disaster that, although was largely due to the ferocious nature of the cyclone, it was also down to a lot of preventable and man-made reasons. To know all about them, you can check out some of the links below. But these lives needn't have been lost on that day. However, this disaster could have become a far, far worse thing. Way more lives could have been lost had it not been for the courage, the humanity and the sheer tenacity of the Indian Navy. So that's this week's story. Uh, if there are other stories of this kind that you'd like me to cover, then you can always leave them in the comment section below. Uh, do hit a like and leave any other comments because it generally helps get word out about these videos to other people. This particular story was taken in large parts from a chapter in the book India's Most Fearless Three, which is by Shiv Arur and Rahul Singh. This book and the other two parts in it, they are filled to the brim with other such stories of courage and of uh, commitment. And if you would like to read more such stories, you can also head over to Penguin's YouTube channel to find one minute summaries of this book and a host of other books, which will help you figure out what to read next. That's it from this particular episode. Until next time, take care and bye-bye.